Pastor Jeff Woodward here from Metro Church. Great to have you with us, by the way. Uh, this is a part of our nighttime services here in Perth. Uh, it's something that we call My Story, and I really do love these times where we get to chat with someone from our church, usually from our church, and uh, get to, I guess, find out a little bit more about who people are. I want you to understand, you know, that belonging to a church is not about belonging to a congregation or a group of people. It's actually about belonging to a family where we do life together. And doing life together means that we get to know one another. And I believe that church is one of the greatest places on earth where it's safe and where you can become known and where you can know. It's one thing to learn the Bible. It's another thing to grow in relationship with God and with other people. So uh, welcome to my story and uh, what a, a brilliant time we're going to have together. My guest today is none other than someone that we know and love very well here at Metro, Mardelli. Now, I'm not even going to say her last name <laughs> because I won't say it properly. Mardelli, you're from Colombia. Yes, I am. A Spanish-speaking country. Mm. So how about you give everyone your full name? So my name is Mardelli Cuesta Moreno. Mardelli Cuesta, Cuesta Moreno. Moreno. But that's, yeah, that's like, why you say in Italian? Is it Moreno? <laughs> why do I say it in Italian? Well, I don't know. That's my attempt at a Spanish accent, I think. Hey, great to have you with us. Now, for just for me. the sake of people that don't know where Colombia is, and there may be some, tell us where in the world is Colombia? So Colombia is in South America. It's actually the first country that you that you encounter when you come from North America. Okay. So then comes Mexico, all the the um, uh, the Central America countries, um, and then you go Colombia. Wow. We, yep. So Colombia is fifty one and a half million people. <laughs> yes. So it's double the size almost of Australia. But how big a country is it? How long does it take you to fly from one side to oh, the other? Oh, no. It's it's funny, you know, because, for example, coming from Perth to Melbourne is like, it's so long. Yeah. When I was telling my mom that I was going to um, to Colombia and then I had to go to Sydney and it was six hours, she couldn't imagine that. Because going from going from one part of the country to the other extreme of the country takes us one hour. Wow. Yeah, it's so a it's small obviously country. a very packed in place. Yes. And a lot of very packed in places relationships are more intense because you are closer with everybody. Is that what it's like in Colombia? It you, definitely is. Your neighbourhoods, you know everyone in your neighbourhood, you know the shopkeepers, uh, yeah. all that, huh? Indeed, it, it is like that. It's like we all grew up as a family. Okay. So you, you end up knowing, you know, the kids, the neighbours' kids, the, uh, grand, the, the grandkids and all of that. And everyone looks after each other often in places yes, like that. Yes, we yeah. tend to support each other. Right. I guess we, you know, Colombia is a country, a developing country. So, right. so we we know that we need to support each other in order to go ahead. So we are like that. We are, yeah, wow. We have we'll other. talk a bit more about that one later, but I'm just always interested in you come from a place where relationships are the normal thing is I know a lot of people, a lot of people know me, I am cared for and supported by a large group of people who are not necessarily blood family. They're not necessarily, you know, like mum, dad and kids. So tell me about growing up in Colombia. What did you want to be when you were a kid in school? I wanted to be everything. How did you? I remember. I have. I have Great this, answer. The, no, no, no. But it's true. I had this memory of me sitting down with my parents, telling them I wanted to do a doctor. I wanted to do. A, I wanted to be a policeman. I wanted to work in the bank. I wanted to be everything. <laughs> there wasn't such a thing like oh, I was so focused on being something. I wanted to be everything. Okay. So I, and as a kid, I had a lot of energy. I still have a lot of energy. Yeah, we noticed. <laughs> but it's not the coffee, by the way. Right. Um, but yeah, I wanted to be everything actually. Wow. So, where do, you are now a chemical engineer, hmm. and we'll come to some other intervals a little bit later, but so where did chemical engineering come up then? That was an accident, actually. Oh, really? So, I grew up, my, my dad used to work in a hospital mm -hmm. as a fitter, and he wanted me to be a doctor. I guess oh. being a doctor was the boon. I grew up in a very small town, oh. so you could be a, either a doctor or you could be a teacher. And my wow. mom was a teacher, so I didn't, I didn't want to do anything with teaching, <laughs> nothing at all. 
So, Did your mum teach you at school? Yes. The, oh, no, that's the worst. No, that? no, no. It was actually pretty good. <laughs> oh, was so it? It, it was the first year. So, so all my primary work was with my mom. And my mom used to push me to be very competitive. You couldn't go home, though, to your mum and say, Mum, I don't have any homework today because she gave you the homework. Oh. No. You know what's the funny thing? As a kid, I was very competitive. So I always oh, okay. wanted to be the best at everything. Okay. So my mom didn't need to push me at all. Okay. I remember once on primary and the first grade, I was falling behind. Like I was the first one, so I chill out because there was no one, you know, uh -huh. close to me. And they transferred these kids from the city. And my mom come and tell me, I think this kid is good. I think he's going to finish the book before you. That's all she needed to tell me. I was <laughs> studying the whole night, the whole day. I finished first. But my mom never had to push me because I was very competitive. Wow. So, so good. the engineering <laughs> thing, you were saying that was an That was accident. an accident. So my dad wanted me to be a doctor. Yeah. And we didn't have medicine in my hometown. So I traveled to the city to do the test. I wanted to study in a public university, which was the best. Which university. city was that? Medellin. Okay. So I come from a small town, uh -huh. very small town called Medellin Turbo. Medellin is also famous for some other things. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, no. We, no, won't, go, we won't go to that one. We'll leave that. Uh, <laughs> no, very good. some person. famous families from Medellin. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So, yeah, I traveled to Medellin, but I was not admitted to the university. I, oh, wow. I wasn't good enough. Wow. So... What was that like, to be told? Because oh. you've lived your whole life in a small place mm. where sometimes it's easier to stand out. Yes. And to be the best is a bit easier. And then you go into this very much bigger environment and they go, you're not good enough. But it's just this case. So in this university that I wanted to be part of, they have 95 uh, available vacancies. Mm. There were 5,000 people all around the country competing for that. Wow. So they only chose, so of 100, it was people getting 94%, 95%, wow. and 94% at some point was wow. not enough. So it was, it was all right. Like it wasn't the best, the, the feeling wasn't good, but for some reason I never, like I never stopped. I was like, okay, if I where cannot... Where does go... your... Think, can I jump in here and ask? Yes. Because you... Where does the competitive... And more than just being competitive, there's a belief in you of not even just, I can do this, but I'm okay. Where does that come from? My parents. Right. So, <clears throat> my town where I grew up is a very poor town. Mm. But my parents never stopped me believing in anything. Wow. Like, I remember hearing my cousins telling their kids um, when they say, I wanted to have a car one day, and they would tell them, oh, dream on. But that's wow. never going to happen. But my parents never stopped me believing so in anything. It's just got to be, though, one of the most important things that a parent gives a child yes. is the belief. Yes. You know, in Australia, we have nicknames, you know, what we, they're, they're, and they're not usually very good. They're often picking out the worst thing, you know, about a child or, or and, and I've heard parents call their kids the worst names and I th always think that's the last thing they need because a child, if they get anything from a parent, one of the most important things they get is a belief about themselves. And so your parents gave you yes. a belief. Wow, that's... They did. They really mm. made, made us believe that we could do anything we wanted wow. to do. And even going... To to study medicine at the beginning when I just mm. moved to the city, it was my mom. She said, if you wanted to study medicine, because I didn't pass the initial mm. test, she said, if you want to study medicine, then that's what you're gonna do. She packed my suitcase, she bought me a ticket, she called a friend in the city, and she sent me there. I left my hometown crying. Wow. She was like, if you wanted to do that, then you're gonna have to go for it. So yeah, that's my parents. I own a lot of things to them. Wow. So, you don't get into medicine. Hmm. Was then engineering like, a, oh, that sounds interesting? Because <laughs> they really are not alike. It is exactly like that. Look, at it's funny because, so because I didn't um, go to university on the first and the initial test, I went to do like a short course yep. that will kind of train me for the test. Mm. And they gave us a second opportunity to go to a different university. So the right. one where I was going to be studying medicine was one, and the mm. one for engineering was a different one. And I remember going through the list of careers offered by this other university, and 
I had the opportunity to just do the test. And I was like, okay, <laughs> let's see which one. Oh, I like chemistry. I was very good at chemistry at university, uh, at school. Let's just go for that one. And, but you know, did you know any chemical engineers? No, I didn't. Did you know, know what they did? No, I just thought, I just thought it was chemistry. <laughs> That's so cool. But the thing is, I would never see, I would have never seen that career in my hometown. It's a yeah, small course. town, so you would have never uh, seen something uh, like that. I didn't even know that existed. But the funny thing is, um, by the time I took the test on the engineering university, my friends, the people I was living with, they told me, oh, if you weren't admitted at this university for medicine, the other one is even harder. Wow. I don't think you're going to be able to make it to engineering. And I was like, okay, I'll just try. And then I was not admitted for medicine, which I am so thankful today. I wouldn't have been able to be a doctor at all. Um, but yeah, I ended up studying chem. I fell in love with chemical engineering. Wow. It's an amazing career. So did you work as a chemical engineer in Colombia? No, for too long, only a year. Okay, um, because there is quite a big oil and gas industry around that whole part of South America, mm, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah, but I wasn't that in love with um, petrochemical industry. I wanted more to go to the bioprocess, which is not pretty much what I'm doing right now. Yeah, right. But yeah, I work in a lab. I work wow. in a small lab. We were doing um, cosmetic products, shampoos. Wow. And, yeah, it was really? interesting. Yeah. Well, it was the beginning of my story, so yes. I find that just fascinating. You know, you go and you study chemical engineering, and I think you're going to be, you know, I, I think petrochemical and all that stuff, but you were actually working on shampoos. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. That's one of the things you can do. It was interesting, though. It was, um, yeah, it was very interesting. So we got to remember Colombia is a small country and yeah. we tend to produce way more professionals than the one that we can actually employ. Okay. So we end up, a lot of my friends are just teaching, and right. doing something completely different to their careers. So where then in all of this process, because I imagine you're still living away from mom and dad and family. By this time, they have already moved with me. So I okay. actually get the whole family go, coming oh, to live okay. with me, yes. Oh, okay. In, in Medellin. Oh, okay. And where does Australia come into all this? How, how does somebody in Colombia go, <laughs> you know, are you looking at a map and just go, oh, I think that'll be. <laughs> that What's the furthest place away from Colombia? <sighs> That's a funny story because I wasn't initially thinking on Australia. I was thinking on the U.S. because I have some relatives mm -hmm. in the U.S. And it's closer. And it's much closer, mm -hmm. it's much cheaper in terms of Better. traveling there. <laughs> no, I wouldn't more, say so. <laughs> more career opportunities. Yeah. Indeed, that part is true. Um, but then a friend of mine once came, I was working in a call center, oh. and my friend of mine came saying she was doing all the plans to go to Australia. And I was like, Australia, that sounds good. I want to go to so, Were you? Sp did you speak English? Well, my point? English wasn't as like no, uh, it wasn't that good. I did like fifty percent probably. Okay. So that's how everything started. The funny thing is, I ended up coming. She ended up not. Oh wow! So she ended up in Canada. So you come from Medellin in Colombia. What do your parents think when you say to them, "Mom, well, Mama, Papa, I'm going to go to Australia"? What are the what is your family? These f people that have believed in you, supported you, they've moved with you, and now you say, I'm going to go. What, what do they say? As always, they say, okay, whatever you want. Really? Yeah. Like, wow. They, like, my parents have a very tough story, especially my mom. My mom used to be incredibly poor when she was a kid, mm -hmm. as poor as not having shoes mm -hmm. and, and going barefoot to school. But she ended up building herself up and then just, you know, she became a teacher. Wow. She she has three houses. So she ended up raising these kids. Wow. So she also, she has this evidence and this testimony to herself that you can be whatever you want to be. Mm. So me saying I'm going to Australia, for them it was all right. For the rest of my families and friends, it was, it was unthinkable. I remember my sister laughing at me thinking like that that's not, like we don't, we didn't have the money for, uh, for me to come to Australia. That was far beyond what you can even imagine. Wow. Uh, yeah, we, we grew up no, no dreaming. Dreaming is dangerous from where I come from because achieving dreams is something that is not for everyone. So it's a little, can be a little bit painful. Wow. That's a great thing to chew on for a minute because for, for a lot of people, dreaming is dangerous uh, in that it's, you know, if you want to avoid disappointment, just don't dream. Indeed, that's mm. what we do. Mm, wow. That's what we tend to do back home. So did you pick Perth? 
Was that where you planned to come? I was initially trying to go to Sydney, uh -huh. but things didn't go the way I needed to go. So I needed certain, I needed a lot of money. I needed my parents to help me financially, and things didn't go through when I when I was applying for Sydney. Mm. But suddenly, when I said, when I changed to Perth, I think it was recommended by my agent, everything started to just happen. Wow. Just wow. one thing after the other one, and then doors open. So what year is that where you, where you come to Perth then? That was 2015. I arrived here on the 9th of November, 2015. Oh, well, the anniversary is coming up then. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that'll be something to celebrate. So when you come to Perth, did you come thinking... I'm going to be a chemical engineer. I will be designing Australian shampoos. <laughs> Not really. Although I work in a lab, it was a very boring thing. It's always okay. the same of the same. But one of the things I did wanted to do was I wanted to be an engineer. Uh -huh. Like I didn't want to end up doing something different to what I studied. I uh -huh. didn't want to be a teacher. I don't like researching, although it's part of what we do. So I, I wanted to be an engineer. And so when you get here... Are you allowed to be an engineer? Um, are there opportunities? What happens? There are opportunities, but there were opportunities when I arrived, but I was very far from being actually qualified in sense oh, really? of my English wasn't that good. Okay. My career wasn't recognized in the country yet. Oh, wow. I didn't know anyone. So, so what did you do when you first came here? Because you got to live, you got to have a job. What do you do? So I, my first job was working as a nanny. I worked as an, as an au pair. Oh, wow. um, that was that was good because you can practice your English with kids okay. and if they laugh at you because you don't speak very well, it's, <laughs> it doesn't hurt your ego that much. So it was good. It was a very good experience. It also delayed my desire for motherhood. Uh -huh. um, so <laughs> <laughs> it was that? good. That delayed your desire for motherhood. Yes. Maybe when I'm 50, 50. <laughs> yeah, right. um, But yeah, it was good. It was a good experience working oh, with man. kids, reading to them, challenging them, they challenging me. Wow. That helped me a lot. Wow. It helped me. The whole time, though, in the back of your mind is, I want to be a chemical engineer. Mm. I want to function in this. So that's, uh, you know, uh, uh, the time goes on. What else do you do? Um, when being a nanny became boring, I jumped to hospitality. Okay. I started to work as a waitress. Wow. That was an incredible experience for me. I think I, I think that's where Rhonda and I first met you. I think, or was it? Or I, well, I've been coming to Metro since two thousand and sixteen. Okay, all right. And so. I and I started to work in hospitality in two thousand and eighteen. Okay. But I think that's when we became closer because ah, okay. I was in Blacksmith yes, and you used you to were. come for a coffee you were, every we, day. We go in there on a Sunday morning <laughs> and get a coffee and we go hello, yeah, we, Indeed, know, we know exactly, you, yeah, yeah. exactly. Oh. So working in hospitality was. Wow, it was eye-opening. Really? Because, yeah, because coming from Colombia, in Colombia, if you want to be someone in life, you have to go to university. Okay. So and so, there's this restriction and there's these levels of, of who you are, where you belong to. So coming to work in hospitality, it hit my ego a lot. Really? Like, yeah, because... Like, I have to embrace that I was still me, even though I was doing something. So is that like, do, like I'm just a servant kind and of a thing? Exactly. Yeah, it, that's yeah. what it is. Like, I like I never even work in hospitality in Colombia because, obviously, that's for the people that don't go to university, <laughs> people that don't have resources, <laughs> people that don't have anyone caring for them. Wow. Uh, sort of, yeah. So coming here and then working in hospitality, it was a moment where God literally just helped me to recognize that what you do is not who you are. Wow. And that changed me. Wow. That definitely changed me. That, that, yeah, that was an amazing experience. Wow. So tell me about that because okay. obviously at some point or other in your life, there began a journey with God in your, in your life and thinking, was that back in Colombia before you came here? Your yes. parents, are they Christians? My mom it is, uh -huh. and my dad is a Catholic. Uh -huh. But I started my journey with God when I was 17 years old. Okay. I sort of always thought that he was real and believed in him, but I made the decision when I was 17 years old wow. in a service, and I was crying like a baby mm. in the service. And since then, wow. since then. So part of our journey with God is often learning lessons in life that we probably wouldn't sign up to learn. Mm -hmm. So the one you were just saying about the whole lesson that's so powerful of I am not my job. 
I am, no matter what job I'm doing right now, doesn't change who I am, doesn't change my potential. And I think that's important because a lot of people are in seasons of life where they're doing things that maybe they didn't imagine they'd need to do. Maybe they're in a family situation where they go, this is a difficulty I never thought I'd ever encounter. And you've got to walk through some of those. You know, one of my favourite verses in Psalm 23, verse 4 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. God's not in the business of helicoptering us out of it, you know, <laughs> snap the fingers and away we go. But we walk through some things. Mm. And so you said how painful it was for you to walk through that journey. Because in Australia, we wouldn't consider hospitality to be bad it's just <laughs> there's so many people that are and and do a great job of it and serve well and love it mm. but for you there was an internal journey for that huh and yet at the whole time you are wanting to be in chemical engineering and there's hurdles i imagine of your qualifications and then your employment etc all those kinds of things mm. that are there where did the perseverance come from? I guess from knowing that God did have a plan. Wow. Like I may did not have one. Wow. I may did not know how things were going to turn out. But I believed all the time that God had a plan. Wow. Like for me coming to Australia itself was a miracle. Wow. So if he had made me come all this way, why finish it now? Yeah, so right. at every moment, and it lasted what, six years since I arrived when I got a job. Wow. At every moment, That's a long time. It's a very long time, and there was a time... It's I a long time if you're doing it every single day and it never gets any closer. But that's where I, I think I made the fair because... So I may jump a little bit, but now that I'm an engineer, what makes me good, I believe what makes me good at what I do more than the technical aspect is my ability to relate to people. Wow. My ability to just come to someone, no matter what level they are, if they mm. are a manager or they are on the front line, and just talk to them as a person. That's wow. something I learned in hospitality. Wow. It took me a very long time to understand why God wanted me such a long time in hospitality, wow. but that I wouldn't have been able to learn in engineering. Wow. And that is actually what's making me able to develop things and just get to things faster. Like wow. I relate to everyone in the company, from the managers, like everyone knows mm. me and I know almost everyone. And, and it's because of that. It's because of what I learned when I was in hospitality. So at the end, it is about the journey. And wow. I think what you pick up in the journey and I think embracing the moments mm. and the times and the experiences yeah. helped me so much. I'm, I'm very grateful mm. that it's funny though, isn't it, how often we will look back at a season of our life that we didn't like, didn't want to be in, but years later we'll look back and go, thank God for that. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I would not be where I am if I hadn't have had to walk through that, even though at the time I really hated it. Yeah. And, and that's something I try to remind myself all the time. I try to go, like when you go to university or to school, right? Like you go through first year, second year, third year. I don't want to go through life not able to learn the things that I am able to learn during that time. Like as long as it lasts, I know time is limited and I want to get as much as I can from the place, experience, and people where I am living at the moment. How did you go though with, you, you're here, you're a nanny, you're working in hospitality, which your friends and family back home in Colombia must have thought, what is she doing? My mom. Yeah. <laughs> so when you'd phone them up, which I imagine you do, and you phone up home and they have first question is, what are you doing? And have you got a job in engineering? Ah, yes. Every conversation. <laughs> and the answer is, no. What are you doing? I'm at the cafe. <laughs> Literally. There was a moment when my mom was telling me, why don't you go to Canada? I heard that there's much better opportunities in Canada. And I was like, and I was like mom. I love the way so many people want to, they want to shape exactly. your destiny for you. Indeed. They want to keep saying to you, you know, that's silly. Give up. Stop that. Oh, it's, it's definitely. And yet if there's a divine thing holding you, you've got to listen to that. And that's, I guess. That's what God does, and I. That's what. That's why learning of the experience is so important. Because I remember telling my mom when she was recommending me Canada, I was like, "Mom, you were there when you saw the miracle. You know that I didn't come here by myself. 
Wow. Like if I if I know that he is where I'm meant to be, so I don't run away. We don't run away when things become harder. Yeah. Like things become harder because there's something to learn, right? So trying to convince my mom to stop telling me to go to Canada, <laughs> it was such a pain. It was annoying. I love the fact though, and it's it's so important for us to be able to look back and go, like you just said, God, if you got me here, and did you ever doubt that God got you here? <laughs> You, you just knew, okay, God was there. I knew it. Wow. Which is a difference between thinking mm. that God can do something and knowing mm. that it was God. Wow. Like, wow. I knew it. So six years is still, like, that's a long time to be just going to work every day in hospitality going, this is not my dream. And fighting with customers. <laughs> <laughs> this is not what I'm meant to do. And you've left behind the the comfort and the security of uh, an entire environment that is so different. Because in Australia, we are very friendly, I think, towards people, but only on the surface a lot of times. We don't tend to go much deeper. So you will, in Australia, you will say hello to your neighbours, but you'll probably never have your neighbours in your house. <laughs> Was in Colombia. <laughs> you too. Hello. <laughs> they are part of your family. They just walk in the door. Yes, you know I guess. I grew up in a little country town where it was more like Colombia than it is like where we are now. You know, everyone knew everyone and everyone helped everyone. It was just the way it was. Mm. And so then I came here where most neighbours don't even know their neighbours' names. Uh, it was a bit strange for you, mm. uh, I imagine, coming from that. So... It was, but because I believe that I was meant to be here, yeah, yeah, I mm. I got along with it. But I also discovered a lot of people. Like I didn't arrive where I am on mm. my own. I had a lot of people that definitely wow. opened their homes for me, and that's yeah. that's what God, you know, wow. that's what He's doing. There were people opening their doors for me, helping me, wow. and they I wasn't giving anything. Wow. You know, so what's wow. mum like now when the day you got the job as a chemical engineer and you ring up Medellin? <laughs> Hello, mama. The, what, what do you say? Buenos dias? Buenos dias. Buenos well, dias. I don't know if it was dias or noche, but yeah, it was buenos. So okay. Somehow buenos. It was uh, buenos dias or noche, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you ring up mum and you say what? I told her I, I got a job as a chemical engineer. What did she say? Oh, she was very happy. She's the kind of person that I'm walking, like I'm talking to her and I'm walking on the street. She's like, just lift your hands and say hi. I'm like, Mom, I'm walking on the street. I can't do that. No, it doesn't That's... matter. Don't worry about what people say. She I'm wants like, you to I'm thank not, God. I know. I'm, like, Mom, I'm not lifting my hands in the middle of the street. <laughs> That's great. So, yeah, they were all very happy. My mom was very grateful with God. Um, yeah. Like after being telling me to go to Canada, now she was very happy. <laughs> That's great. So... You came to Metro, you said, in 2016, mm -hmm. correct? So how much impact did a church family make in this whole journey of the nanny, the hospitality, the dream of the job and all of the journey that that took? How, uh, I'd just like to know, how important was it church family connections? It was massive. Really? It, yeah, it was massive. Um. I, when I came, I lasted around two months that I wouldn't talk to anyone. I would come in and out. Really? So every Sunday, I wouldn't talk to anyone. Until once, there was a girl here that she left a long time ago, and she she talked to me. She, I was waiting for the traffic light to change, and then she just reached up to me and she talked she to me. And she said, you were at Metro, weren't you? And I was like, yeah. She walked with me the whole time. Wow. We, we spent like two hours walking around wow. the city. And at the end, when we said bye to each other, I gave her a hug. And I am not a hugger. Wow. But I just felt like, oh, like like someone just, I don't wow. know. Like, I didn't know I was feeling that lonely. Wow. And that was the beginning of everything. Then that just rolled over. I started to go to Paolo's and Mel's uh, Connect Group uh, okay. with all the Brazilians. I started to serve in the cafe. And church became that place where even when it was just once a week, it was a place where I belonged. Wow. A place where I felt like I have I have family. Wow. So yeah, it was it's been incredibly There's a big good. difference, isn't there, my Delhi, I found in my own life between simply going to a service. As good as that is, and we love it if people do that. But when you actually 
particularly if you start serving, because when you start serving, you start building relationship with people more than just, I'm back here watching what's up front. Mm. And I think about all those years in view and hospitality, and now you lead the hospitality team here at Metro. Uh, even though you're now an engineer, whenever you're back here, there's Mardelli in the cafe helping and re- you know having people involved and serving and all that. And I think God doesn't waste anything in our life, does he? He does yeah. not. Yeah. He, everything is godly calculated by God. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's so brilliant, so wonderful. Mm. Talk to me for a minute because you you FIFO. Uh, mm. For those who don't know what FIFO is, FIFO stands for fly in, fly out, yes. and it's fairly recent um, kind of a phenomenon in, in Australia. It's only been the last several decades where it's as common as it is now, and people literally FIFO around the world from Australia and to Australia. So here are you. Uh, flying to us. How far away is the site you fly to? It's just one hour flight. It's what, not that long. So you're up there for two weeks? One week. One so week and one week I off. do eight and six, yes. Eight and six, mm-hmm. okay. So talk to me about what that's like to be in a place where I'm imagining you're very work-focused and not very relationship-focused and then you come back out of that and you've got six days... You know, it, life must look a bit like this for you. It? <laughs> it's sort of, but I think I can't really separate the work from the people. Wow. You, I don't forget about people. I forget about eating. Just yesterday I was talking to a uh, um, doctor because when I am focused at work, I forget of drinking water. I forget about food. I just work. But I do not forget about people. Wow. Like, and that's something I think... I learned through hospitality wow. and obviously my relationship with God. At the end, it's all about people. Everything wow. we do, if we, if we, if I'm gonna step on someone else's life to get to what I wanna get, then it's not worthy. Wow. So everything I do, I try to just get people first. Wow. Like the way I talk to people, the way I deal with problems. It doesn't matter how upset I am. I always try to put people first. Wow. Job. Second, that what are the challenges for you as a single woman of living a FIFO lifestyle? It's cool. I like it. Yeah. But see, it's six days that I can do whatever I want to do. <laughs> it's so much fun. So it's becoming shorter and shorter, though. The break, it used to be long. Now it's like, hmm, that's feel like just 24 hours. Uh, um, it's, it's good. I really enjoy it. It's being challenging on the sense of food. I have forgotten how to cook. Oh, really? My friends, I, yes, I, I don't want to have people coming over because I don't know how to cook anymore. So <laughs> that part is a little bit challenging. Right. But the rest, I think that when I started to do five, or I, ha- I already had a life. Right. I already have friends and very strong friendships. So not wow. just people that I'm starting to relate with, but it's really strong friends, people mm. that feels like family. So it's, you know, coming back, it's, it's not that bad mm. so it's just coming back to have six days of me time i do need me time yeah and then just talking to a few friends sometimes i don't want to talk to much people i just mm. want to have time to myself wow. so that's good that allows me to do that wow wow what an amazing story thus far for your life and seeing what god has done and and what a valuable life lesson for you of the whole thing of perseverance and the fact that God does bring your dream to pass, even if it seems to have so many detours and so much difficulty, you know. Uh, but, you know, it's funny. I remember my first class at university, there was a professor, um, a calculus professor, and he asked us all, we were around 100 students, and he asked us, how many of you would like to get your engineering certificate today? your engineering diploma today. And a bunch of us just lifted our hands. We just wanted to be engineers straight away. And then he asked us, so what are you going to do with that? Like, what are you going to do with a diploma where you actually do not know how to be an engineer? Like, the time in day is for you to learn how to be what you want to be. So I became an engineer way before I graduated because I have learned and embraced everything. And I think that's the same with God. Like, every day is an opportunity to learn. Wow. It's, and it's the same at work. As long as they don't fire me, I'm happy to go back and keep making mistakes because that allows me to grow. And it's the same in life. That's how I see life. Wow. People, experiences, hard times. They're just, you know, opportunities for you to be better, 
to learn. It's funny that that isn't it, how God thinks like that. Like, if you think back to when Jesus said to the disciples when he called them, he said, follow me and I will make you. Mm. He didn't say, follow me and I'll teach you. He didn't say, follow me and I'll educate you. He didn't say, follow me and I'll give you. He said, follow me and I'll make you. And I think that God has that whole concept about our life of he's making something out of our life. Uh, that we often discount the process because we've got a goal we want to get to. Mm. We're so keen, like your university professor said, you want to get to the goal, but if you don't go through the process, the goal is meaningless. Mm. And it's the same for all of us in life, whether that's in our relationships or in our health or our finances, particularly in our walk with God. I find that God's not interested in all my shortcuts. I'm very interested in all my shortcuts. <laughs> I think we are. <laughs> I want him to like do it quick. And he goes, I'm making something out of you mm. in the journey, in the process. You think of the life of Joseph and lots of people in the Bible for whom there was a process of making them. That when they got there, they were very glad for what God had brought them through. So yeah, I think it makes a massive difference when you have actually take an opportunity of learning through the process because then mm. when you are there, it's not that hard. Yeah, well. Like I don't want to, if I ever become a superintendent or a manager or someone in a higher position, I don't want to start getting ready when I got there. I want to take every opportunity through it yeah, so great. that I can learn. So when I get there, wow. I'm already sort of ready for the position. Yeah, Maybe well. there's more to learn, but if you want to learn things when you are on the spot, it's going to be incredibly hard. Yeah. Life is going to be difficult. So wow. if we actually, if we embrace every opportunity, every day, every experience will be better, then mm. we're going to be able to enjoy when we just get there. Wow. So what do you do? Final <laughs> question, because we do have to bring this to a conclusion. We'll sit here all day talking about, because I've got a million questions about growing up in Colombia and et cetera. But um, what do you do on the tough days? How do you cope with the tough days when family that are mum, dad, brothers, sisters, whatever, are so far away. You, I mean, you don't get back to Colombia that often. What do you do on those days when Mardelli is just by herself? What? Do you, how do you, how do you deal with those things? I come back from to the beginning. Right. I always come back to the beginning of. Why? Not just in my professional life, but my spiritual life. I try to remember why is it that I wanted to be here for. Wow. And, and that helps me to, to get meaning and get purpose and get straight. On it. It's okay. You know, you can handle it. It's just one day. Last swing, for example, was incredibly hard. Wow. Um, but then I go back to three years ago. Wow. When I was complaining about making burritos. <laughs> 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 oh, I go back to seven years ago when I wanted to be an engineer. Uh, I go back to when I was um, on holidays and I was able to pay for my family to go in on a very fancy holidays. Yeah. So I always go back to the beginning and remember the purpose because I think that when things get hard, I don't want to give up because I know my purpose. My purpose is clear. Wow. So if I'm feeling like giving up, it's because I have forgotten the purpose. I have wow. forgotten the meaning of what I'm doing, wow. what I'm doing. Life is tough. Life is hard. Going back to Colombia in December reminded me of that. Wow. So we got to embrace it. And that's something I tell my, you know, the people on the front line. I was like, you, we need to stop coming to work with the idea that everything is going to be okay. Because that, that is, I, I heard someone saying happiness is equal reality minus expectations. Wow. So I was like, we need to stop coming here like everything is going to be okay because that's what's making us unhappy. We need to come here knowing there's going to be a bunch of problems that we are going to need to solve. Yeah, that's why and you're that, there. And that's what changes yeah. our mentality. Yeah, so I'm wow. trying to get them all ready to come to fight. Mm. And that's life. Mm. Nobody, and Jesus said that, right? Jesus said life is going to be tough. So just embrace that toughness. And Isn't I, it funny though how much of your spiritual life you know, you're just talking about what you're saying to staff and to people that are all qualified, they've all got expertise, they're all hired because they're good at it, they're in the job. But what you're teaching them is stuff that you've learned in a life with God since the age of 17. You're not teaching them how to, you know, chemical formulae. What you're teaching them is this is how life works. Mm. That's brilliant. Well done. <laughs> I think, let, let, me, let me finish by asking you this. Are there any prayers 
when I say prayers, I don't mean written down ones, but is there something that you find yourself praying for often? Mm. Saying, God, would you do this? Would you, is there something like that that keeps yeah. popping up in your private prayer life with God? Every single day I pray for wisdom. Oh. And I pray for God to help me to show his grace because sometimes I forget. Wow. I pray for God to remind me of his presence. Yeah. Because when I'm completely focused on work, I completely forget sometimes <laughs> that God is there. <laughs> so I, I, I need help with, I need wow. the Holy Spirit to help me to remember that God is with me at every yeah, yeah, wow. moment. And I, I pray for God to help me to be helpful. I want to be helpful in wow. everything I do. It's not about me. It's about other people. Wow. So I want to be able to help no matter what it is. Wow. So that's, that's things that always go in my prayers every wow. day. Well, look, I can't think of any better way to us to end our discussion with you. I'll talk to everyone in a minute about uh, how to begin a life with God. But I, I'd love it if you would pray for everybody. That's a part of this. You can pray in English or Spanish or both, if you like. Because, yeah, well, I meant anyway. And, uh, but for those things, because what you're saying, I, I just amen every one of those. I go, yeah, I pray for wisdom every day. I pray for God's guidance every day. I pray for strength every day uh, and to be aware of God. So how about you? Would you mind? I, yeah. I, There's a lot of people there. Let's pray for them. Okay. Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, the opportunity to share our lives and to help each other to grow, God. Thank you because it is you the one laying the path for us to walk. You have designed a life for us and we believe that you have greater things for us. Thank you so, so much for for our lives being a blessing in, so in other people's lives. Help us to, to help, help us to be helpful in other people's lives. You have given us gifts, yes. you have given us blessings, you have given us so many things that we can share and we can help other people to, to make life easier for them. Yeah. God, give us wisdom, we need your wisdom. We can't live this life without your wisdom. We need to know what to do, when to do it, how to do it, how to say it, Lord. Help us to, to be closer to you and be able to to know you better mm -hmm. and know how you want us to be and how to li how you yeah. want us to live this life. Help us to to be conscious of your presence all the time, God, because you are with us 24-7. You never leave us. And sometimes we forget that. When th when things become tough, we, we forget that you are mm -hmm. there for us mm -hmm. and that you are there with us. You, you're always here, and that's something that we always need to remember. Thank you so much for everything you do in our lives, Lord, and help us to, to be helpful, help us to be a blessing, God, and help us to see you at every moment, in every situation, with every person. Mm -hmm. We pray today for you to bless the lives of the people that are watching this, and for you to, to open the eyes, to open the minds, to, to be able to see what you got for them. Mm -hmm. Thank you so, so much for everything you've done, and in your name, we pray. Amen. amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, Mardelli Coesta Moreno. Well done. Hey, I'm halfway to being Colombian. Uh, thank you so much, Mardelli, for sharing you your for life. That me. was so interesting. Fantastic. Listen, can I just take a couple of minutes here to chat with every single one of you that you heard Mardelli talk about the fact that at the age of 17, there was a moment of decision for Christ. And I don't know the background of how you got led to that point. I do know that for every person I've ever met, God was in the background of their life long before they got to the point of the decision. He was working on them and drawing them. There was a hunger and there was, and, and sometimes it's a little hard to be able to pin down. I know for me, it was like, where did that come from? But there was the work of the Holy Spirit. And so I know that for many of you, you would be aware of that and just conscious of a rising desire for God and awareness and, and just a, 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 maybe a thought of, well, God, if you're there, I'd like to know you. And I would love to help you make that step as Mardelli did to make a commitment to Christ. When I say make a commitment to Christ, it's saying to Jesus, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to open my life up to you. I'm going to let you be a part of me from now on. And it's so easy that you can say yes to Jesus so beautifully and so simply that you can do that. Uh, up on the screen for you right now, there's the phone number if you're in Australia that you can just send YES to that number, 0488 826 392. 
or if you're outside of Australia, or maybe you'd just rather get our help via email, it'll come to you completely free. There's no strings attached. You go to yes.metrochurch.org.au and if you will send us your yes, then the next day we will send you uh, a Bible verse and a prayer. And they fit on one screen of a smartphone. By the way, it's not a lot to read. It's just something every day that will help you start walking with God. Because as my delegates pointed out, it really is a lifelong journey, isn't it? Uh, but it's not a lifelong journey that culminates in knowing God. It's a journey that begins with knowing God. Send us your yes. Would you do that right now? Send us your yes, 0488 826 392 or yes.metrochurch.org.au. I know I'd love to be able to know that you have sent your yes in to Jesus and uh, then you'll get that help. You're always welcome here at Metro Church, every service, every event. Uh, you're more than welcome to be a part of that. We would love the privilege of becoming your family, as my deli has pointed out. And uh, th that's one of the great things about the family of God, my deli, isn't it? Is that you can go to the opposite side of the planet and the thing that unites you with other people. I thank God for whoever that person was who stood next to you at the traffic lights. And I know that a lot of those moments take place. It's not all about the preaching or the creative team or some other part of it. It's those moments where someone in church cares. And we pray that you will come and let us be part of that journey for you in Jesus' name. Don't forget uh, everything. Go to our website, go to the app, discover what it is that God is doing here. We'd love to see you as a part of it. Thank you. Thank you.